Uh, thank you for staying with us on the Monday report tonight. As I've been promising through the news hour, we are delving into matters prostate cancer. Earlier I said prostate, but it is prostate cancer. A gland we'll be discussing. It is a cancer that affects men um, specifically. And uh, risk factors, in terms of risk factors, black men and Asian men, I read, are more prone to getting it the older you get. Uh, the higher your risk factor, but I am no doctor, so I will leave it to the doctors. And on that note, let me introduce them to you. We are joined, sitting right on my left, Dr. David Kimani, and he is a urologist, a senior medical specialist in urology. And uh, he is based at the Kenyatta National Hospital. He is also an honorary lecturer, Department of Surgery, University of Nairobi. Good to have you here with us tonight. So I'm guessing urologist has to do with the urinary tract? Yes. Oh. It is uh, everything to do with the urinary tract and male reproductive health. And male reproductive That's health. That's why people call us male gynecologists. Male, oh, okay. good to know. <laughs> but you're actually a urologist. Oh, <laughs> urologist. Yeah. Yeah. And sitting next to him is an oncologist, and that is Dr. Uh, Primus Ochie. And he is a clinical oncologist, University of Nairobi, Kenyatta National Hospital, uh, represented very well tonight. And uh, the lady on the panel representing the Kenya Network of Cancer Organizations is Phoebe Ongadi, and uh, she is executive director. Happy to have you here with us tonight. And we're also joined by Joseph Otieno. It's a good thing he's here because what he is is the head of benefits design and actual services, SHA. So the hashtag is Monday Report. My name is Olive Burrows. We're coming to you live from the Kenya Medical Training College, KMTC. So the people in the room know what they're talking about. So do send your questions. Hashtag Monday Report. I will start with you, Dr. Kimani. We were in the process of explaining what the prostate is, a prostate gland, and, there, and from that, what prostate cancer is. Thank you. Thank you, Barrows. The prostate is a gland that is found in all men. So all men have a prostate gland. And uh, it is a gland of the reproductive system because uh, when you are having uh, contact, uh, most of the fluids that come out come from the prostate gland. So Wait, it when produces... you say having contact, when you're having intercourse, yes. you're talking about semen. It's semen, uh -huh. yes. And uh, most of the fluids therein comes from actually the prostate gland. So it has a very important role. And God put it just below the bladder and then uh, put in the tube, the urethra, that moves urine from the bladder out such that the, the, the tube passes through the prostate. Not surprising, therefore, that if there is a, 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 an abnormality of the prostate, an enlargement, it will uh, make that pathway narrow and therefore make the process of urination a little bit difficult, mm -hmm. as you're going to see in the signs of, of prostate cancer. Yes. So this is what a tumor grows? Now, when you talk about a cancer, uh, our bodies is in uh, a constant state of uh, reproducing. Cells are being made every day, cells are being destroyed, the ones that are abnormal are being removed. And that process is very tightly controlled. Now, when there is autonomy such that some cells decide we are no longer being controlled by the body, they continue producing themselves or reproducing themselves without limitations. And that is what is called a cancer. We say uh, the cancer cells uh, keep on reproducing, uh, multiplying, and the multiplication factor is, say, if you had one cell today, tomorrow you have two, the next day you have four, because they are, uh, the, the, the increase is geometric, if I may use that, that terminology. And that gives us a very good opportunity, such that when the cancer is in these early phases, it's very slow growing, mm -hmm. and we can contain it. Unfortunately, when it's in the tail end of the event, the cancer cells now you start infiltrating tissues around it, for example, the bladder. They may infiltrate the, the, the rectum behind, or they may involve the blood vessels and move to distant sites, such as the liver, the kidney. But commonly for the prostate, it moves to bone, and it causes very debilitating bone pain. It sometimes you cause collapse of bones of the vertebrae, and with it, compress your spinal cord and make you paraplegic. Such is cancer, but the bottom line is, in its early stages, is completely asymptomatic, such that you may have men sitting within us here and they have cancer, but they are not aware. Mm. The good news is we are able to pick cancer in its early stages, and in its early stages, it's curable.
Mm-hmm. Yes. So early detection is key. Yes. But then how do you do that if it's in the early stages you are asymptomatic? But we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Uh, let me bring in the oncologist at this point. Um, Dr. Primus, this is the most common cancer, according to what I've read, affecting men in Kenya. Is that the situation? Absolutely, yes. That is the most common cancer in men. And... Uh, the other bit about it is that it affects the old men, mostly from the age. We see it a lot from the age of 50 and more 60. And as we go higher with the age group, we find it more. And as Dr. Kimani has said, when it is early stage, things are very good. But when it is late stage, it is very debilitating and very sad. Most of these men are pensioners. And you remember. Cancer treatment is not cheap, it is expensive. You need money to control it. This cancer affect where we pee through or where our urine pass through. And sometimes or more often it blocks the urine pathway and can cause terrible pain. This cancer loves the bones. And in the bones it can give you terrible bone pain that the normal painkillers can't control. It can even make you break your bones. Now the trouble is that we all want our dad to be healthy. He's worked for us very hard. He has educated us. He has suffered to make us who we are. And that is the time when you're supposed to make them happy, then cancer gets in. And then cancer causes the trouble, so they get so much pain. And so when in our clinic we see patients with cancer of the prostate, and usually the late stage one, usually it is very debilitating, the family gets devastated, and there's a lot of suffering. And we know that cancer is not usually a disease of the person who suffer from it alone, but it's a family problem. And when people are old, remember they have the wajukus and all that, and all these people get as well very sick. So cancer now is becoming a highly stigmatized disease. Cancer is becoming a family disease. Cancer is causing a lot of emotion in the family and prostate in particular, the family get very sick and very disturbed. Mm -hmm. Yes, Phoebe, this is not a conversation uh, that I have often encountered. Uh, we hear about breast cancer awareness and we put on the ribbons, uh, but where men are concerned, this is really the first time I'm personally hosting a panel where we are delving into matters prostate cancer. Have we left men behind in these conversations? Uh, thank you very much, Barrows. I think uh, men are soon becoming the, the, the species that is left behind. And as you've rightfully put it, uh, at this point, we were expected to have the blue ribbons like we do in the pink October. We have pink ribbons to commemorate breast cancer. And you still wonder why so, and yet prostate cancer, uh, we look at the global uh, cancer estimates data, over 3,500 in 2022 men were diagnosed with prostate cancer. And what is very sad about that is that over 2,900 in the same year died. So it means whatever we are diagnosing uh, in prostate cancer, we are losing more than half of the men. So then you ask yourself, why then? Why are we losing half of the men? And the answer is hidden in late diagnosis. Mm. And the doctor has explained that very well. And it took me back, uh, I remember when we were taking care of my dad, for our, he unfortunately passed away from prostate cancer. And for a very long time, we knew we were, we were treating what we call chronic uh, urinary tract infection mm -hmm. because uh, prostate cancer is a pea disease. And even by the time the old man was telling us, he must have suffered for a very long time. So stigma is the issue. We need not to leave the men behind because we, they are dying. And yet we are saying that cancer, a third and half of them can be prevented. So it means these 2,900 men that we are losing every year because of prostate cancer, half of them can be prevented. A third of them can be prevented. So men conversation ought to be on the table. We are just coming from Mental Health Awareness Month and we were seeing how the men already are left behind on matters, on matters of mental health. So it is high time this conversation happens. It is high time we push the, the men's health on the agenda table. And it is high time we talk about the effects of prostate cancer among the men population in Kenya. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Joseph, you find yourself in the hot seat because <laughs> listening to these experts, they say the key is early detection. So knowing this, uh, you know, what provisions has a social health authority made for testing, for instance? 
Okay, I'll start by mentioning the reason why the government come, came in with three funds. Initially, NHIF used to be one fund, so it was more of a members club. So if you're not contributing, you could not get any service. So what the government has done is they brought in three funds. The primary health care fund, we have the SHIF, Social Health Insurance Fund, where it's the contributors club, which used to be like what NHIF used to be. And then we have the emergency, critical illness, and chronic fund. So what is happening is under primary health care fund, all you need to be is a registered member, and registration is free. So even if you're not paid up, you're able to access that fund. So all you need is once you're registered, you access the fund. Under primary health care fund, we have outpatient services. That is basic outpatient. We have inpatient services in level three hospitals. And then we have the screening aspect for four priority cancers. That is cervical, breast, prostate, and then colon cancer. And that is expected to start from next year, July, or, or as soon as the funds are available. And uh, that is where now you realize all, once you're registered, the screening will be able to, to be taken. Because that is funded by the government exchequer. And then under SHIF is where you'll have the main management for cancer. And uh, then under emergency and chronic illness is where you'll have your palliative care for cancer and then the, other, the rest of the management. Did you hear you right when you said the funds are currently not available for the screening of those cancers? Yes, uh, but it is planned to start from next year, July. You know, you can understand why perhaps Dr. Kimani might be sitting a bit uneasy because uh, Phoebe as well, uh, Dr. Oche as well, because they're talking about early detection. Will cancer wait for those funds to be available? Uh, we, we know we appreciate cancer does not wait, but we are also in a setup where we have limited resources. So we are really, the government is really trying to see what they can cover. And that's why even particularly for cancer, the financing model has changed. And Dr. Kimani and Dr. Primus know that. Initially, we used to fund cancer through sessions. So you find if you had you are going, you're undergoing basic management, basic chemotherapy, then you are only being entitled to six sessions at 25,000. So once that was done, then you're left alone. At the same time, if you had, you are being managed by second line or third line, then you also had a maximum of six sessions. So what Shah has done right now is ensure that you are given a global figure, and then we have guidelines that have been provided for through the National Cancer Control Program and National Cancer Institute that are going to be used in management of these patients. So these guidelines are, are being integrated in the system to ensure that right now, every service that you need is going to be provided for with that, within that limit so that you are not limited in terms of the number of sessions you get. You can get the complete care as required. And so the government is listening, but we also have to be privy that we have limited resources. But what we can assure the country is by next year, July, this will be rolled out. Hmm. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll pick that up a little bit later. But first, uh, Dr. Kimani listening to Phoebe, and, and she talked about her dad. And they thought this, were, this was what a chronic urinary tract infection. Is that a misdiagnosis? And, and why, how does that happen? Thank you. And, uh, uh, let me, let, me, let me say this, that uh, when you look at prostate cancer, unfortunately for us, 75% uh, of our patients come in stage 3, stage 4 disease. And only a very small proportion come early. The truth of the matter is, in its early stages, cancer is completely asymptomatic. And therefore, when we go out to the population to look for cancer in those patients who have no symptoms at all, that is what is called screening. On the other hand, there are patients who have a peeing problem. Maybe you are waking up a little bit more often than, than not at night. When you uh, get to the washrooms, mama is complaining every day. You can't get the stream mm. to, to the bowl, so she, uh, she has to keep on washing the, the surface of the, of, of the floor. And the, the, when we now look for cancer in that group of patients who are symptomatic, that is called early diagnosis. And unfortunately for us, our mamambogas and our fathers in the villages, their first point of care is in that dispensary. So whom do they find in a dispensary? Is it going to be a nurse or who our, our good MTC is training or a clinical officer? If they are lucky, they may find a doctor in a level three, level four hospital. When they come there, it behooves us as healthcare providers to understand what are these 
uh, symptoms of cancer such that we don't end up giving them treatment for urinary tract infection when it's a, it was supposed to be an, it's an infection as a consequence of prostate cancer. So you can still have prostate cancer and infection. And that is why we want to have this conversation to see whether we can reverse the trend. Can we be able to pick these patients before they become symptomatic? And those unlucky few who become symptomatic, can we make the diagnosis early so that then we can refer them to the appropriate management uh, chain before things are too late? Mm -hmm. That is our hope that this uh, meeting today is going to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Dr. Ocheng, screening. How do you screen for prostate cancer? In the things I have watched, I hear you, it's an invasive process, or is, has there been advancement in technology? Yes, so thanks so much. There is quite a lot of advancement in medical technology in the last 10 years. Things have rapidly changed. And actually, the screening of cancer today, mostly done by the urologists, before what we used to do in the screening was simply to take little blood and then test what we call the PSA. But then as time now go by, we are actually able to do better screening. We are now able to use what we call imaging. We are able to use things like ultrasound to check. People are even going now to use MRI. And PSA is something which you don't need to be a specialist laboratory technologist <clears throat> to be able to do it. You can actually do it with a strip which, like the ones that women use to test for pregnancy. So it can give you what they usually call either a positive or a negative. Now, after that, then we then can take and then find out how high it is, which now you need a laboratory technologist. And that's what we had actually hoped that uh, from the blueprint of SHA, that at the health centers, they actually were able to do that screening of either positive or negative, and then anybody who tests positive can then be moved forward to the laboratories, maybe at a higher health level practice, and they now quantify the PSA. So once they get the PSA high, which is the cutoff usually 10, then they can then move ahead to do now the biopsy. So we don't need sophisticated machines. After that, then the sophisticated machines like the MRI and all that, which doctors like uh, Kimani can use, can then be used. Yes. So we can actually check prostate at a dispensary, at a very low level of healthcare system, just with a little strip. And then we say, you most likely could have it. Now, there are, as Dr. Kimani has said, that uh, having a high PSA, which we commonly use, does not confirm you are prostate. Because one of the things that has made some countries be very, very careful with the use of screening is that PSA alone does not say you are cancer positive. Yeah, it is a use for screening. It helps the doctor suggest that you could have it. So further tests have to be done to confirm. And that's where Dr. Kimani and his team, the urologist, come in. Mm -hmm. Yes. You have something to add to that? Yes, uh, perhaps uh, for clarity. When you talk about screening, I know, uh, Barrows, why you are talking about <laughs> the back. Uh, traditionally, a screening of cancer involved uh, a prostate uh, examination, where you put in a finger through the rectum, feel the prostate, whether it's hard, nodular, and the likes. And the unfortunate bit is, when you feel, you're only feeling the back part of the prostate, and you're not seeing the front part of it. Number two, by the time you're feeling it, it's a very advanced disease. Mm -hmm. And therefore, some uh, groups have actually omitted the issue of uh, uh, rectal examination as part of the screening and you are left with a PSA, which is a simple blood test. Mm -hmm. And once the blood test is high, it's not your duty as a primary health provider to interpret it. You just say it is high, refer for further evaluation. Because mm -hmm. like Dr. Ocheng, out of 100 patients who have a high PSA, only 40% have cancer. 60% don't have cancers. So it is now the specialist duty to differentiate who needs further investigations and which investigation is this. Because sadly for us, many patients, you now, from there, they go to an, an ultrasound. An ultrasound that is not helpful at all. Mm -hmm. They spend the little money that they had on a wrong test. Mm -hmm. So by the time you are coming to you and you tell them that we want to do an MRI, they have already spent time and money uh, on unnecessary investigations. So our message to the 
public healthcare workers or the people down there at the grassroots is once you've done the PSA and it is high, refer to uh, the, the special aid centers. That's a very important message. And I would like the, the, the healthcare providers to familiarize themselves with their age cutoff. You can take your age, uh, put it in a calculator and, and ask, what is my age specific PSA? What should be the number for my age? I am 50, so my PSA should hardly go beyond 4. If you are 80, your PSA should not go beyond 6.5. So that is what the message we want to pass on to the, to the general public. So and when you say PSA, you mean prostate um, specific antigen? Prostate specific antigen. Uh -huh. And prostate specific antigen is not prostate cancer specific. Uh -huh. It is prostate specific, meaning the disease that has caused the high PSA is in the prostate. That is the only specific thing about it. Now it's your duty to say, out of all the diseases that can cause a high PSA in the prostate, which of this is the cancer in these patients? And at what age should we start testing or screening? Very, very good question. Of course, if I came to MTC here and I started screening these young men, I will find, hardly find any cancer. It doesn't mean I can't find, I may find. We have, I think, our youngest patient of around 17 years with prostate cancer. So we have, if you're doing population-based screening, you want to balance your test such that you do not end up with everybody who came for the testing being negative. Neither do you want to wait until by the time you are screening, everybody has very advanced disease. So for purposes of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of screening, the biggest population that must be screened is if you are between the age of 55 and the age of 69. Though that's the group that benefits most from screening. But if you are of African descent, mm -hmm. African means you're black African, mm -hmm. or if you have a family member who has had prostate cancer, irrespective of your race, whether you are Mzungu, whether you are Asian, then we bring forward your age of screening to around 40 years. So in Kenyan population, therefore, because we are more or less, to a large extent, the black population, our age of screening should start at 40. And we have said, since PSA rise precedes clinical disease by about 10 years, there must also be an age to stop. Because if you are 90 years and I screen you and find a positive PSA, the disease is likely to be clinical at the age of 100, in which case there are more competing causes of death than prostate cancer. And to put it into perspective, Barrows, one in six African men will develop cancer in their lifetime. One in six. That's how common it is. The good news is a very big proportion of those patients will develop a type of a cancer that is very slow growing, doesn't affect them, doesn't cut off their life expectancy, will not become symptomatic in their life. And therefore, it, a diagnosis of prostate cancer also does not mean death for you. Mm -hmm. But equally, there are those patients who will develop a very aggressive cancer, and it's our duty as doctors to identify and isolate who is this who's likely to develop an aggressive cancer, so that in our management, we're also aggressive in managing it. All right. So I, I want to just take up, you know, ask a question each of you, Phoebe and, and uh, Joseph, before I open the floor to questions, so you can start uh, preparing those questions uh, from our audience. But Phoebe, you know, when it comes to breast cancer, I can... You know, check myself at home. It is convenient. And if I find a lamp, then I, I know the next way forward. Uh, for people in remote areas, in rural areas, um, is it possible to incorporate the community health workers, even people in informal settlements, such that it's this trip that Dr. Cheng is telling us about, they can come round in this trip, uh, check our age, our risk factors, yeah. and carry out the test? It is extremely important to incorporate the community health promoters and uh, we currently have a very good model in this country where uh, there are stratified community units. So there's a community unit that is headed by a community health promoter. So that acts like a linkage between the community and the hospital. So what we are calling for action, what we are pushing for is that uh, if there are patients who have gone through prostate cancer and they have survived or they're in treatment, especially the men, we are calling them to join the community health promoters and we're also calling the, the community health assistants and the community strategies to consider having 
the male patient survivors or the male lived experience. Why? Because it would be easier for them to have a peer-to-peer -peer approach in, in spreading the awareness on prostate cancer, especially in the community. Just to give an example, we recently Kenco and its membership had a screening event in Westlands. And it was extremely successful because we had over 48% of the participants, participants being male. It was one of the highest we have seen. So when we dug deeper, we realized that the community health promoter, the, the team was mainly men. So men are a bit biased. They want to listen to men more than they, they listen to the ladies. And of course, men also look at accessibility. In that screening camp, we had the, 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 the quantitative uh, serum testing for PSA, and it's easy and it is highly, uh, it's better than any other. So when they hear of that, they come. So the community health promoters are also very important because they help us to demystify. You realize one of the barriers to accessing care is the myths and misconceptions. Uh, the symptoms of uh, prostate cancer is urine related. So men with stigma issues, they will rarely share about urine related problems to their families and to their people. So the community health promoters with the right training and the right capacity build, develop, building, they can able to help us to demystify uh, some of these myths and conceptions. But we are calling on the government and we are calling on the community units to empower, look out for these patients who have been through this journey, look out for the, the, com, uh, the community heads or uh, stakeholders or what we call the celebrities, the community, who, the men who can stand up and speak on behalf of other men. So it's very important to have the the community health promoters, but we are pushing that let the, the survivors, those who've been through the process, lead the community health promotion, education awareness for prostate cancer. All right. Yeah. So, Joseph, uh, how much will you be providing come July uh, for testing, screening of prostate cancer? Okay. Uh, even currently, what, what Dr. Kimani was mentioning, once you do the PSA and it's high, when you require an MRI for diagnosis that is provided for, at the same time, let me just mention for other cancers, we are also providing mammography for screening, that's for breast, and we also have fluoroscopy for other, to check for other things. And for those who have hypertension or suspicion, there is cover for echocardiogram. So from July, we are going to look at full screening for cervical cancer, full screening for prostate, and then we are looking at... Uh, so when you say full screening, what do you mean? Screening. We're looking Full at, screening. Yeah, for we, we're going to cover PSA test. Mm -hmm. So when it's high, then you will go and get the MRI done, just for. for so the PSA is not currently provided for. Yeah, not yet. Yes, Phoebe. Yeah, I, I just want to add something for Joseph. I think what Joseph is not telling you is that uh, the social health uh, insurance fund on paper is perfect. But uh, what Kenyans say, V to qua ground, mm. totally different. And unfortunately, the patients on oncology treatment and the non communicable diseases, the NCDs, have been on the receiving end. So when Joseph tells us to wait, unfortunately, that tumor, that prostate that is enlarging, is not waiting for, for anyone. And what he's not telling you is that. Uh, on paper, it is indicated that the critical illness fund, they, they need about 70 billion to cover the entire country or diagnosis, which is perfect because why cancer is still number three leading cause of death is because of the late diagnosis. How to counter that is to bring the new diagnosis, which is perfectly on shift paper. But now, uh, when Joseph goes back to, to government and says, I need the 70 billion, what does the government tell him? Tell him, I can only give you 4 billion. So you can imagine he wants 70 billion, he's been given 4 billion for screening. It is more near impossible. So let that process of migration from NHIF to SHIF be very clear and let not the oncology patients and the non-communicable disease patients be on the receiving end because these are patients who need consistent uh, treatment over a long period of time and it is very unfair if we are being told that they need to wait when the tumor and the prostate gland is not waiting. Yes, Dr. Kinani. Perhaps to muddle the waters more is that this patient whom has waited and is lucky for Sha to give him the MRI, which I know they are partially refunding, not, not fully uh, for the MRI, and he has to move from Kavirondo to Homabe to get the MRI done because that's where the hospital is. And once the MRI is done, there is no, radiolo there are no, no radiologist to report that MRI because our human resource uh, arrangement in this country is appalling. Mm. You find a facility that has excellent equipment, but the staff who are trained are in a different county. Mm. And now, what do we do with our healthcare? We devolved healthcare 
Little did we know that we cannot devolve our bodies. Meaning, you can't devolve your head to go to Kilwea, your chest to go to uh, Moranga, and your, your prostate to go to, to the coast. Is that once you are in a facility, you can get any part, any tumor in any part of any part of your body, and therefore you need services that can uh, can help you as far as uh, the cancer uh, care is concerned. The reality is that when you go to the counties, there is a very big mismatch because the counties are not training. The governor, you're not train a urologist because the urologist is going to take five years in school. Mm -hmm. And by the time five years are in school, uh, uh, five years are gone, the governor will be on his way out. He has, he has left. So he can't come and tell the people, I trained this number of specialists. And that's why governors want to take what are called the low-lying fruits. And that is why the doctors, we have been on the forefront in advocating for centralization at least of the human resource. Because the Minister of Health, when he's sitting in, uh, in Afia House, can be able to say, in Nakuru, I have an MRI. I must have a radiologist there. But the situation is now you have a, an MRI here, but a radiologist is in Rodwa. You have a urologist here, but the PET CT is in KU. That is the kind of disorganization that we, that we have. And the unfortunate bit also is that we are busy making and repeating and replicating the problem mm. through the so-called uh, cancer centers that we are establishing. Cancer centers are not a hall for administering chemotherapy. A, a patient with cancer requires comprehensive uh, multidisciplinary input. Meaning, when the patient is in front of the uh, community health provider and they have agreed to do a screening, and the, screen, the PSA is high, that patient already is emotionally disturbed. Mm. I'm having a cancer. Need someone to talk to him. Then you need to come to a doctor. Dr. Kemani is going to assess and send the patient to Dr. Uh, Ochieng for an MRI. The MRI is going to be interpreted by somebody that's brought back to me for me to do the biopsy. When I've done the biopsy, I have to give it to a pathologist for the pathologist to read the specimen and say, yes, this is cancer, this is the grade. From there, we say we are going to do staging. We need a PET CT, we need a bone scan, we need a CT that requires further investigations. By the time you are making a diagnosis now, we have to now again sit Dr. Ochieng, myself, another doctor to say, what is the best modality of treating this patient? And then we'll say, we'll start with surgery, and then go to radiotherapy or go to chemotherapy, and so forth, so on and so forth. So when you say you have a cancer center, for heaven's sake, what cancer center are we talking about? All right, so yes. I'll, I'll press pause on the conversation there because I want to open the floor. Uh, Dr. Kelly Uloch will come back. He's talked about uh, training. Uh, what role does KMTC play in bridging that gap? We take a break, but when we come back, we hear from our audience. You can also ask your questions, contribute to the conversation. The hashtag is Monday Report.